Thank you for everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Michael McFadden, who has been fighting the anti-smoking movement since, well, uh, since Methuselah was a lad. Um, and you'll be talking today, uh, fighting with prohibitions, tools, tactics, and strategies. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. My, uh, I have a rather bad back, and it's been a long day, and I want to stand up and stretch for a few, for about 10 or 15 seconds. I want to do it by myself. Everybody stand up and stretch. Freedom Alliance and the Smokers Club in the United States. Most of my presentation today is going to be based around tobacco smoking and the anti-smoking movement. Uh, I believe it relates strongly to alcohol prohibition and to other kinds of lifestyle infringements by governments upon us. But my own experience is really just with the anti-smoking movement. Over the last 20 years, particularly over the last 10 years, we've seen the smoking prohibitionists grow very strong. They've grown strong on the basis of two things, a whole lot of money and a whole lot of lies. In the United States today, the tobacco control folks are getting over $800 million a year from smokers' tax money to attack smokers in one way or another. $800 million a year. That is an enormous amount of money. A few years ago, during our Super Bowl game, which is known for having outrageously expensive advertising, the anti-smoking groups actually bought two full commercials on the Super Bowl game to hit smokers with. People were so upset by that waste of money. It was, I don't know, maybe $50 million was spent just on these two commercials that uh, they never came back and did it again. They do this. They use that money for TV commercials. They use it to set up front groups promoting smoking bans. They use it to convince researchers to produce studies that will support stronger bans, higher taxes, and ultimately fear and hatred aimed at smokers. When they come into a town to push for a ban, they're like a blitzkrieg, column of armored tanks rolling into a little farmland where the, the people who live there, the bar and cafe owners, smokers, they're like farmers with pitchforks up against tanks. They have almost no hope of stopping them because they don't have the experience, they don't have the money, they don't know what they're facing. They think, oh, it'll never happen here. They'll come and make noise and go away. And all of a sudden they realize that won't happen. They're not going away. They're going to keep pushing for this ban. Very sadly, what I see happening then people immediately turn around and say, it's inevitable, we will be assimilated, we cannot stop them, surrender. That is what we have to fight against. We have to convince people that first of all, they will be attacked, and it will be a serious attack. And then we have to convince them that they can fight back and win. Or, if they have already lost, like here in Holland, that you can stand up and overthrow what was done to you. How do we fight that much power? And this will answer Dick's question there. Simple. Uh, aim at their strongest point, at their weakest point, with our strongest weapon. Their weakest point is that their campaign is based on lies. We may not have a lot of money, but we do have the truth and the facts on our side. The lies that built their power 
will be the same laws that destroy them. When people see that their businesses and pubs and sometimes even their private social and family lives have been destroyed on the basis of lies, they'll get angry. And it's that anger that we can build on to get people active in fighting the money of the anti-smoking lobby. I'm not going to go into this at length. Several other people have already commented on some of these. The message when we are arguing with their statistics has to be simple. People know that you can tell lies with statistics. They can stand over there and say this number and that number and the other number, woo woo woo. We can go over here and do the same thing. And the ordinary person is going to look at them and look at us and say, well, the guys over there, they got all the doctors on their side, I'll just go with them. We have to get through that. We have to convince people that our message is different that they are telling lies and that we are telling the truth. And I believe we can do that if we keep our message down to looking at some of the simple lies, some of the ones that they tell that are so clearly lies that we don't, you don't need to be a master's degree, uh, to have a master's degree or a doctorate in mathematics to understand They've just said two plus two equals five. That's wrong. All right. Usually they argue for smoking bans on the basis of lung cancer and heart disease in terms of health. For lung cancer, there have been about 100, maybe 150 studies looking at long-term lung cancers in people who've lived with smokers or worked with smokers for 30, 40, or 50 years. Some of the studies have found a pretty clear indication that lung cancer increases after 40 years of exposure. Some of them, fewer, but still some of them, have found pretty clear indications that lung cancer decreases after being exposed to many years of smoke. And most of them really didn't simply find anything at all. They just went a little bit up or a little bit down from being Eh, who knows? So the lung cancer argument is basically false in terms of showing anything statistically. But even if you accept the claims that the anti-smokers make, something like the big US EPA report, where they said lung cancer will increase by 19% if you're around smokers. What they really found which if you work around and or live with smokers for 40 years, your chances of getting lung cancer will go up from about four in 1,000 up to five in 1,000. After 40 years of being exposed every day, there your chances will go up by one out of a 1,000. And that is only if you give them the benefit of the doubt. They had to stretch it to come up with that. In terms of heart attacks, there are three basic kinds of heart attack studies that you'll hear claims about. The first group are just like the lung cancer studies I mentioned, just long term. They say it's 20% or a 30% increase in heart disease if you live with a smoker. The second group, you've probably heard this, if you're around a smoker for a half hour, you can get a heart attack. Even 30 minutes of smoking, is of being around smoke, is dangerous. Well, what they've done, they've taken people, stuck them into a chamber, filled it with smoke much more dense than anything you would find, except in some Dutch bars that I went to the other night. <laughs> it's very rare that you will find a bar so smoky that it would come anywhere near these smoke chambers. 